What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on another brilliant guest. He is a doctor. He is a family man. He is also a commentator and writer. And this is Dr. Joel Brown. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Zuby. I appreciate that warm welcome. No doubt, man. Happy to have you here. So, Joel, for people who are not familiar with you, please introduce yourself and tell the world a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I'm, uh, as you mentioned, a, a medical doctor and, um, you know, a father, a husband. I live in the United Kingdom. Um, I emigrated here from Jamaica um, when I was sort of around 15 with my family, my parents, and uh, settled in, ended up going to medical school, um, you know, and uh, yeah, after sort of finishing that phase of my life and my education and starting work, um, you know, uh, went, went on to get married and have children. I've got a bit of a story to tell about how, you know, my life and identity kind of, um, you know, flowed from there. Awesome, man. So let's rewind a little bit, man. Tell me yeah. a little bit about your upbringing. So you said you were in Jamaica until your mid-teens? Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, grew up in a, uh, you know, Christian household, parents, fairly conservative, um, in a, in a part of Jamaica, um, that was, uh, a bit, bit rural, not far from Kingston. And, um, you know, sort of had a high school experience there that, that I enjoyed. I think one of the things about my Jamaican heritage that, um, you know, that I look back on that I feel was quite formative to my, uh, you know, upbringing was just, um, you know, my grandparents you know, spent spent time with them in the countryside and really kind of um, was inspired by their resilience and inspired by just uh, the, the way that, you know, their outlook on life. And, um, you know, just yeah, had a chance to have a bit of exposure to farm life. My grandfather was a farmer and uh, grandmother was um, in, in education. And, um, and as I said, just had a, a real strong, good sort of um, childhood really enjoyed that and then and then as I said coming to the UK uh, at the age of 15 was a was a significant culture shock mm. what was that change like yeah so I think for me I grew up with a very kind of you could you could argue it as a sort of a singular way of viewing the world um, I kind of had a worldview that was already kind of set up for me, as I mentioned, you know, kind of fairly conservative Christian household. And, and so most of my friends were, you know, uh, Christian, uh, very similar values, very similar outlook in life. And then kind of being transported from, from that into the UK, where it's a much more multicultural society, you know, people with different faiths and perspectives, uh, political ideas that were very different from the ones that I, you know, um, you know sort of grew up, you know, harboring. And so there was a, a already for me this sense of, well, how, how do I navigate a world that's so different? So it's the funny the way that travel just kind of opens up you know, uh, you know, a, a massive Pandora's box of mm. just, just the way the world, how, how different the world can be from, from what you're used to. Yeah, no doubt. What were some of the most stark changes and contrasts that you found coming as a teenager from Jamaica to the UK? And also, what part of uh, what part of England were you in? Yeah, that's right. So I, I moved from Jamaica to, to Bradford, UK. And interestingly, mm -hmm. just before coming to Bradford, um, not many people are, are that aware of Bradford. In fact, when I tell people I live in Bradford, they often go, where and then I'll say, oh, it's not far from Manchester because everybody's familiar with Manchester United <laughs> Football Club. So it just kind of it's an hour away from from Manchester. Um, but at that time, when I came here around circa 2001, um, Bradford had a lot of tension. Uh, there were there were sort of um, race riots that were happening um, in, in the city, and, and I mean, you know, some, some significant um, devastation to parts of the city, fires and. And um, so, as I said, some tensions between um, my understanding the majority it was tens tensions between the South Asian population, Pakistanis, and, and, and whites in the area. So, I, so I was aware of this happening. We didn't have any family in the Bradford area at all. We just had a few connections, um, and because my mum was originally from London, uh, so we had some family in London. But you know, so com coming into to Bradford, where there is where these racial tensions existed. Um, and coming in as a as a 
as a black kid from Jamaica, um, I was just like, okay, what's going on here? This is a whole different religious landscape. It's like in Bradford is kind of known for its a significant South Asian population. So it's quite a lot of Muslims here and Sikhs and Hindus. And then, you know, not, not that many Christians. And it was just an interesting kind of melting pot of cultures and religious perspectives. Yeah. Was that, that must have been quite odd for you because I would imagine that growing up in Jamaica, if you think of England, you probably didn't picture Bradford. Because to be honest, Bradford is probably, not, to this day, it's not exactly very representative of a typical British town or city. So I would imagine it would have been very different, actually, from what you would have anticipated. You probably would have thought, oh, okay, you know, I'm going to a predominantly white place, perhaps a predominantly Christian place, and so on, yeah. because that's a more accurate view of England and the UK as a whole. But, um, what what yeah. was it what was it like i mean if you were going to school there and everything were those tensions present in school or was that just something that the grown ups were getting up to yeah, so it was great. So you're, you're totally right. I should have mentioned that I'd never been to the UK before I emigrated here. So despite the fact that my mom was here um, as in London when she and she left when she was around 13, her parents came over to the UK in the kind of Windrush era. So she had that British heritage uh, up, up until the age of 13, but then grew up the rest of her life in Jamaica. And then we hadn't gone as, as, as kids, my, myself and my two siblings. So it was... It, you know, I mean, the only sort of, I guess, apart from my mom's experience, which again, she was a child, the only, we had a very kind of, um, or view of what England would be like was very much based on the media, whatever we saw on television. So yeah, it, coming to Bradford was, was, it was a total shock. Now, in terms of some of that, um, the cultural, uh, you know, issues and challenges, certainly um, I saw some of that in, in school. I mean, the school I went to, the, as I said, it was very, very diverse, very mixed, but I would say majority South Asian population. So in fact, interestingly, I actually learned in school, um, unfortunately, you know, some of the kids, the boys would be like teaching teaching me, um, you know, I, I learned a bit of Urdu, uh, Punjabi, you know, from, from some of my schoolmates. Um, I remember a really quick story when I was uh, hanging out with some of the boys and, and they said to me, oh, you know, the next time a pretty girl comes around, uh, say to her, um, Miki Mopi Day. And I was like, oh, because that, you know, that's like a polite, polite greeting to say to them, you know, to say. I, and I went up to a girl, you know, who, who I thought looked nice and said, Mickey Mopi Day. And she was about to slap me. And she said, <laughs> And she said, a Mickey Moppy Day in, in Urdu uh, uh, means uh, give me a kiss. So, I, and which of course, <laughs> I thought was just a really polite thing to say that tricked me. Um, but I mean, but I actually enjoyed, um, you know, my, my time at school. I did my A-levels actually, uh, you know, and I was, you know, because I'd already done the equivalent of my um, earlier exams in, in, in the Caribbean. But, you know, I had... Uh, I had some really good friends who are some of them, some of which are still friends today, you know, and then 20 odd years on. Yeah, because you've chosen to stay in Bradford, right? So you still live there. That's down right. There. Still, still live here. And though many times I've considered leaving these parts, it's just, it's just, you know, this it's, it's home for, for this season of my life. Mm. Um, you know, but, but just to touch on the, some of the tensions, you know, because at that time, Bradford, had this very real sense of, you know, these challenges, these difficulties between groups, um, you know, and I and I've I, I started to to realize that, um, you know, for for me, some of the, some of these tensions, were, I think, I think there was a, a large misunderstanding between what were the kind of needs and priorities of different groups, and there were kind of um, tropes and assumptions about different groups and why they were here and what they were trying to do in, in the culture. And there was like the sense of that people weren't really willing to, to listen to each other beyond the kind of headlines. But actually when you got into it and you started to just have conversations with people and listen, it, there was so much more common ground than many of us often realized. And, and as I said, I mean, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity and the experience I had in this kind of multicultural um, ver version of, uh, I guess, the UK experience. But I think more importantly, though, um, was my willingness to actually, you know, to, to listen and, and to learn and move beyond the stereotypes and actually hear the individual stories of people. Um, and and it's, it's, it's equipped me for life, I think, uh, in many ways because of the world that we live in now. Mm. I'm curious, regarding these tensions, what lines were these across? Are these tensions across 
ethnic lines, nationality lines, religious lines, skin color lines, all, all the above? Uh, all the above. Describe to me. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> well, I think because, for instance, um, you know, I was aware that within the Brathwood context, I mean, they, uh, as I said, there was an increasing South Asian population, um, a mixture of Muslim, Sikh, and Hindu. Um, and then they, so there were tensions within that, um, within the ethnic minorities in terms of, I could remember difficulties between Muslims and, and, and Hindus and Sikhs because of religious differences. Mm -hmm. um, then outside of that, there, there were definitely also tensions between, um, you know, so those who were deep Asians and, and whites, and, and, and also because there are some, some Blacks um, in, in the sort of Bradford area, there's a Black, uh, you know, Afro-Caribbean community uh, presence as well. Um, but, but again, the, the, the feeling that perhaps, um, you know, the immigrant population and the, and the sort of the population of, of people who are consider themselves indigenous to the UK, tensions around the resources, uh, which of course there were concerns around the, the whatever the limited you know sort of resources that were available, and maybe whites feeling threatened that you know South Asians are coming here to take their jobs, and 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 again if there was a sense of okay, it's easier to just look at this group and see the group as a threat, period, mm -hmm. and not actually be willing to to look beyond that that, that very kind of oversimplified um, you know kind of sort of approach to, to viewing things. Yeah, it's a tricky one. How has that evolved in the couple decades that you've been living in the city? Are these tensions things that have subsided? Has it stayed around the same? Has it gotten worse? Has it changed? What's it like now? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And I and I would suspect, but I've not looked at any objective data on this, um, you know, but my sense of having been immersed in the city and I still, you know, I have still could try my best to have conversations with different groups. I have friends in, in, in a variety of these different groups. I feel that things have gotten better, which interestingly, if you, I, this is not uncommon. I think lots of places in the world, because I also have friends in different parts of the world that have historically had really bad racial uh, cultural tensions. There's been this sort of trend towards um, an improvement of, of the of the of the relations in these groups in these groups, but unfortunately, sometimes that gets kind of overlooked. Uh, the way that um, you know, because of course, in, in in recent times, with with this kind of hyper focus on, on on race and differences between groups, and and this feeling like the world, uh, you know, is just as bad as it has ever been, and there's no change. There's sometimes the, these narratives that are that are so unhelpful uh, and, and actually overlook real progress that's been made. I'm not saying that things are perfect. I'm not saying that there aren't still parts of of Bradford where you could still find there are you know really heat of physical. Uh, difficulties. I mean, not not something that's been super on my radar recently. If I'm honest, uh, as I said, things are largely better. Um, but as I said, uh, you know, it's a, it's a shame that sometimes in the world that, that just generally speaking seems to be overlooked. Yeah, it's it's a general human tendency. Um, you know, I think that I've noticed that there tend to be sort of there's more there's obviously many many worldviews, but two ways. Two ways I really see this manifesting in terms of what you're specifically talking about is there is a worldview which compares things to history and to the rest of the world. And then there's a worldview which compares things to an imaginary utopia, which doesn't exist and never has existed, where everybody gets along perfectly and there is zero racism, zero sexism, zero uh, ethno you know, zero ethnic conflict, zero right. meanness in general, zero any type of discrimination or tribalism or anything like that. So I think when you have people who are focused with that latter worldview, mm -hmm. they often can end up, what's the best way to put it? They can mm -hmm. often end up undermining society and undermining culture because yeah. they do not recognize progress, right? Their comparison, if you're always comparing to a perfect utopia, then no yeah. matter what country you're in, it could be UK, it could be USA, it could be any country, right? Any, especially Western countries where a lot of progress has been made in this regard. And 
you're still going to keep saying, well, it's it's worse than ever, or it's as bad as it's ever been. Or, you know, I've heard people say that the UK is the most racist country in the world. I've heard people say the USA is the most racist country in the world. This is one I know, but someone has not traveled anywhere, right? right? When they're saying things like this, because does racism exist in these places? Yes, it exists in every country in the world. Mm-hmm. But if you look at history, if you go back 100 years ago, but go back to 1923, look at the UK, look at the USA, look at the amount of bigotry, racism, people killing each other, people lynching each other, fighting, right? Segregation, all, all kinds of, all kinds of crazy stuff that you can't even, you can't even sort of fathom now, that sort of thing. Even if you just go back 50 years ago, there's certain things that, uh, you know, my dad, when he came over to the UK first in the, in the seventies, you know, he's got, he's got stories. He's, he's a doctor as well. You know, he's got stories to, to say one, um, and this is as a doctor, you know, mm-hmm. he struggled to get accommodation and he had to yeah. get one of his, he had to get one of his white doctor friends to, uh, get the accommodation on his behalf because they yeah. did not want to rent to a black guy who is a doctor FYI. Yeah. And this is, and this is in the seventies, right? That kind of thing. Yeah. Can you, you, you can't really imagine that even happening now, right? You'd no. be like, wait, what on earth? Like someone doesn't mm-hmm. want to rent because you know, it, it just wouldn't even be, you know, we've overshot in many regards, but People are, people are not recognizing this progress. And I think the absence of having that perspective and that gratitude is really what's causing a lot of what people now call, you know, wokeness, cultural Marxism, yeah. the anti-racist nonsense, all that. It's, it's this massive overcorrection, which is stemming from a lack of gratitude and appreciation. I agree that there's still progress to be made and mm-hmm. we should continually be encouraging people to judge one another on the content of their character and not their skin color and all these other immutable characteristics. But yeah. what's happening is they've just taken the whole thing and they've just inverted it. So they're saying, okay, no, it's, it's okay to do that as long as your target is white people. You know, you, you can be racist right. against white people. You can be sexist against men. You can be, yeah. you know, you can, you can attack people as long as they've got some type of perceived power in this hierarchy. And it's mm-hmm. just undoing, I think, a lot of the progress that has been made over the last couple of decades. Wow. That's, yeah, that's super. That, that's so powerful. And I relate to what you said there. I mean, you mentioned that, you, you know, you had a dad that came in the 70s. My, my mom was born in, in the in the, in the sort of 50s, 60s here, here in the UK. Yeah, she told us, uh, you know, stories of some pretty awful things that were said to her, um, you know, growing up. You know, she was called a monkey and, and, and other things like that. And so when when she came and told us those stories when we were children in Jamaica, I mean, I mean, growing up in Jamaica, despite the fact of the colonial legacy and so on, the, the sense of me being black was never, um, I never considered it a barrier to anything, achieving anything. Doctors that we saw were black, the police officers, the judges, you know, yes, I'm not denying that in Jamaica there were um, the, the kind of, the remnants or, or the legacy of, of some colorism. And, and of course, there were, there, there'd be issues, uh, again, related to, 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 to race, but it was very far, um, you know, it was just very far for me. And it certainly didn't affect my my aspirations, what I believe was, was possible for me. So I'll give you a really quick example. When I first came to the UK uh, and I was in school doing my A-levels, and I mentioned to one of my teachers that I wanted to become a doctor, he reacted in a way that was a bit surprising to me. He was sort of, he, he felt a bit surprised by my aspirations. And, and at the time, I, I just kind of was, I just was a bit perplexed because I'm like, well, my, my, my aunt, my actual mom's older sister, she was a you know, rheumatologist uh, working in Canada. Uh, my pediatrician that looked after me as a child and family doctor looked, looked after my parents, you know, were, were black. I was a you know, fairly um, you know, gifted you know, kid, I was, you know, reasonably smart and I, I applied myself. And so, you know, when he said to me at the time, you know, that, um, yeah, essentially, if you became a doctor, that would surprise me. I was a bit annoyed by it. And I'll be honest. It didn't, I didn't assume it was racist at the time because I didn't have that assumption that anyone would think someone being black in and of itself would preclude them from having the aspirations to, to become a doctor. And I think that that's, it's a shame because now is the assumption that we're almost taught that if you're a black person and a white or non-black person has any kind of um, view about you or surprised in some way about your accomplishments or even how you speak, it, you must assume that it's all to do with them having some kind of racial animus. Uh, they, they are inherently racist and so proven otherwise. And that may be the case that there's some people who have 
a racially based view uh, or assumption that because you are black, perhaps you are, it's, you know, this is beyond something that you can achieve. But also what was interesting at the time, lots of the other black kids, especially those born in the UK, um, they didn't themselves, um, many of them, when I told them I wanted to be a doctor, they were just as surprised. Some of them were just like, you know, they were like, uh, uh, you know, they just didn't realize or didn't feel that that was something that, um, you know, one, I guess, somebody that looked like them or, or maybe maybe someone from a similar kind of economic background would, would aspire to. And then, as, of course, in, in the in the UK in Bradford, it is socioeconomically, um, it is, it is, you know, I grew up, well, the school that I attended, most of them were working class backgrounds, that, that sort of thing. And so I think that there was an element of just, you know, culturally that the expectation of you know of, of people from from kind of in the Bradford area uh, you know aspiring to be the doctors it's just it, it just wasn't it wasn't that high on, on, on the radar um and so I, you know I think I think for me what you said there about the experiences in the past and being able to um, you know, look, and of course, this was about 20 years ago when I kind of had this teacher that, you know, seemingly had this question mark about my, my aspirations. Point is, I didn't allow that to stop me from pursuing my passion to pursuing my dream. And, and you know, and, and I and I think that being able to look back at the at my parents and, and previous generations, yes, they endured some things that they shouldn't have. Yes, they they had more overt experiences of, of, of discrimination, racially based, like you mentioned, your dad not being able to get a flat or people being released from their job on, on, on the grounds of their race. And, and you know, but at the same time, they have, overcome so much and the world that we live in and we've inherited you know from them is so much better than 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 it was and i think that that allowing me to have the attitude therefore of you know what i'm gonna pursue what i what i want to do despite some of the challenges pushbacks or or, or question marks rather than just sitting in despair of thinking the woe is me the world is not mine for the taking mm. it's so interesting what you said there because those older generations who experienced more genuine racism and discrimination and nastiness along those lines, yeah. overall speaking, they complain about it and dwell on it far less and have yeah. far less of the victim mentality than people of our and younger generations, which is something that's quite fascinating. It's like the less racism, the less isms and phobias and discrimination there is in the country or in society, the more um, people want to play victim or the more people obsess over something which has greatly diminished. And I find that so I find that so fascinating. I've noticed with the same, I spent a lot of time in the USA as well. I interact with a lot of people. And, you know, I, I've met older Americans who grew up under Jim Crow laws. Um, yeah. I've met people who, you know, they're parents actually had to deal with the Ku Klux Klan and things like that, right? Yeah. And they generally are not the ones who are, you know, constantly dissing the USA and cussing it out and saying everyone's racist and hating on white people and this and that or complaining about white supremacy 24 seven. That's coming from like the college students. It's these 19 right. and 20 year olds who, I mean, they've been <laughs> they've they've been coddled if 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 anything right like they've just you know they're living in this world where you know with microaggressions and trigger warnings and safe spaces and you know just asking where are you from they yeah. find offensive right there's no there's no person who's 70 plus years old in the uk or the us there's no black person who if you ask them where they're from they're going to you know throw a hissy fit right yeah. they'll just answer the right. question but now there's yeah. people who are like 16 17 18 years old you ask them where, where, you know, where are you from, which, which is just the most basic question. It's not even, doesn't even have a racial overtone to it. Yeah. And they all say that that's a microaggression. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It's, it's quite fascinating. It's like, um, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, instead of making, this goes on many regards, but I've commented before that it seems like instead of trying to make young people more resilient, they're trying to nerf the entire world. Wow. Right. So they're trying to prepare you know, what do they say? Prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. But it, that's just been totally inverted now. 
And it's yeah. just like, okay, we need to remove every single thing that anybody, that the, the thing that the most sensitive person could potentially find offensive, we mm. need to remove that. That's why they're going back and they're rewriting old books, whether it's Roald Dahl or whatever they're, or, uh, you know, James Bond novels, they're going back and hiring sense, what they call sensitivity readers. And they're, they're changing the language and they're trying to, you know, change words that people are allowed to use in schools in colleges in, in, in medicine I've seen even, um, yeah. It's and it's, insane. yeah, it, it, it's insane. I mean, I think it's good to, I'm on board with politeness. I'm yep. very much on board with politeness, but politeness mm -hmm. and political correctness, certainly to the degree that things are going are, are not, are not the same thing. Um, yeah. Once you're trying to totally manipulate language and censor people and control people's tongues and prevent them from speaking English in the way that the language is normally spoken because there's yeah. someone out there who could be upset by it or who could be triggered. I'm like, well, yeah. that's that. That's that person's problem, yeah. right? If, yeah. if you get triggered by the question, where are you from? Yeah. That's a you problem, right? Yeah. That's not the problem. That's not the person who <laughs> you don't need. You don't need to control the person asking the question, but you need to think, okay, what is it within you that's making yeah. you so weak that you can't deal with this? Yeah. I want to say something to what you said there about the disconnect between um, the generations of the past who endured, um, you know, the kind of more explicit, extreme, undeniable experiences of um, of racism, and uh, and more contemporary generations who, largely, what we complain about is, is what what has been defined as microaggressions, um, you know, or just you know being, as you said, uh, bothered by what we feel might be ignorant um stereotypes um because for me my story and i've shared this in other places but just because i think it'd be helpful to uh summarize it for the benefits of your audience as well as that despite the fact that i grew up um in a fairly sh fairly sheltered um environment uh you know and even my time in the uk i can recall two or three incidents where someone said something to me that I could look back and say, okay, yeah, that was offensive. That was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, that was it. I've never had any kind of, I mean, otherwise I would say I've had a pretty, um, you know, pretty amazing ride. I mean, I've had a chance to go to university and study to become a doctor and, uh, and, and, and thrive and have a multiplicity of relationships across the spectrum of people from different backgrounds, white friends, you know, Pakistani Muslim. So, and we all see each other as, as human beings, despite our differences in conflict, uh, political and religious differences is weird, despite coming from, from that kind of, um, you know, that kind of background. And then in my thirties, you know, getting married, having a child, and then having what really fundamentally is, was a, a, an identity crisis. I remembered feeling like my name is Joel Brown. And I started to buy into this kind of oversimplified narrative that Brown, um, I should feel outraged because of the fact that I carry the name of what essentially would have been likely if you trace it back far enough, the, 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 the plantation um, owner that uh, enslaved my, one of my earliest ancestors in Jamaica. And I remembered mm. starting to feel this disconnect and dissonance from that name. And then that started this process of me, you know, questioning and, and feeling really quite um, angry. So there was this, this, this anger about history and feeling like I live in that legacy and I'm therefore, my potential is somehow going to be limited by that, despite the fact that I was actually doing okay, despite, and, and as a result of, of that, you know, feeling this sense of, of, of despair, this, this, sense, this sense of, of, of rage. I remember even feeling like Christianity, I wouldn't be Christian or any of my family wouldn't be Christian had it mm. not been for you know the missionaries that went across and and, and of course you know uh, European transat transatlantic slavery they were you know forced into forced to become Christians etc just a, a, a version of, of history that was convenient to demonize um, Christ, you know Christianity altogether or to mm. demonize just it was like I became I, I absorbed this sense of, of, of victimhood that as a result of that, um, caused uh, an under sort of undermined my faith, 
undermined, um, created a severe amount of anxiety, depression as a result of feeling like as if the world, the weight of the world, um, you know, as is, is on my shoulders and, and all black people vicariously, we should all be participating in this, in this sense of lamenting um, mm. what happened. Um, to our ancestors. So it was less about my actual direct experience of, uh, you know, a racial conflict or harassment or uh, and more to do with, of course, there was a sense in the, the police brutality situation, of course, George Floyd and some of these other examples of, of Black people um, having negative experiences triggered, you know, sort of like, like, like these triggers uh, that would then make the rage, just the cycles of rage, and it just produced purposelessness, helplessness. Um, as I said, severe anxiety. Uh, I nearly wanted to quit medicine because I felt like, you know, I, I just didn't want to have to live in in, in, in the West anymore. And I felt like as if I wanted to, perhaps there was this utopia that you spoke of earlier that yeah, I could go to somewhere, maybe go go emigrate to Africa, find some place where I wouldn't have to, um, to feel like I'm reminded of, of the consequences of racism. It's really sad what happened to me and nearly derailed my, my life. And that's part of the reason why I feel so passionate. And I, and I align so much with the way you speak about these issues. Well, we could say, yes, there are legitimate experiences that are negative that we could say that shouldn't have happened, that people shouldn't view the world uh, in that really unhelpful way. But then there also is this sense of rehearsed, um, you know, victimhood, which I think just exacerbates this sense that we are somehow trapped either in history or trapped in 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 the views of a minority of people who just basically need, need an education. Like for instance, I always say white, white supremacy is just ridiculous. If you just mm -hmm. read enough of history, you go, you go, there's no reason to believe that any person based on the amount of melanin in their skin are, are more intelligent or, or more capable than anybody else. All human beings have the capacity and the potential to, to achieve great things. And we also all have the capacity to do stupid and, not, and, and really, Terrible things, um, you know. But again, it's just it's just me thinking and reflecting on my life, and and that's part of the reason why I'm inspired by you know just as I said the way that you speak about it and the way that you've been writing about your experiences and trying to help people. I want to do the same for people who suffer from any types of uh, victimhood. That's awesome, man. I, I love to hear that, and thanks for sharing that story. I want to even get into it more. You know, I yeah. think it's interesting because I I think the reason why these different why those type of worldviews, let's call them mm. grievance, grievance-based worldviews, resentment-based worldviews, these don't just happen along racial lines. There's yeah. a, a, any dimension of humanity, there's a, there's a narrative for this. I yeah. think it's really attractive to people for multiple reasons. And I think the first one is because there is, there is truth to it, right? So yeah. if you look at the world, both currently and historically especially, there is a lot of injustice. There's yeah. been awful violence, there's been brutalization, there have been genocides, wars, all sorts of nastiness, invasions, colonizations, uh, slavery, whatever group you belong to, and how yeah. take the word group however you want, right? You can come up with a valid narrative that shows yep. that you are or were that your people quote unquote mm -hmm. are or were victims of at the hands of another group yep. and the natural follow-on from that is to feel some type of victimhood within yourself and some type of resentment towards people who did that or mm -hmm. who are potentially descended from people who did that or even who just look like the people who did that right if yep. you're a woman and you've gone through some, uh, you've experienced some type of, of essay or genuine trauma, right? At the hands of, at the hands of a man or even multiple men. Mm -hmm. I can understand how a woman who has been through that and then is also seeing other things that happen to other women and reading about certain things historically, I can totally understand how someone becomes one of these, you know, ravenous, man-hating, raging, bitter, feminists, right? Who's, yeah. Who just wants to smash the patriarchy and thinks that all men are, all men are this and all men are that, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bad worldview, but I can yeah. understand where it comes from. I can understand 
if you sit there and you go through certain his things, you know, reading all the things that the, the British Empire did, or, you know, various European empires, things that they did in, in the Caribbean, in the USA, in the continent of Africa, and you're reading all this stuff, and you're even looking at the images, and you're seeing all, I mean, it, it, it makes, it makes, it makes me mad, right? Because it's like, oh my gosh, this is, this is horrible, right? If you go and you read about the Holocaust, and you're seeing what happens, like, it's, 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 yeah. it's horrible, right? It, it's horrible. And if you can see and identify yourself in that group in particular, then it's even more so because you're thinking, wow, these are these are people who, you know, if I existed at this time, may, you know, I would have been a victim of this thing or, yeah. you know, maybe this is one of my ancestors or something like that. So I, I think I, I think a mistake some people make more on the sort of right side of the political aisle or the conservative side is that I, I think sometimes people want to gloss over it a little too quickly. Yeah. Um, just like I think the, 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 the problem on the, on the left side of the aisle, especially nowadays is the flip side, which is that people want to dwell on it and mm -hmm. validate everyone's anger and bitterment, bitterness and resentment, even if when it's directed at people who, who literally had nothing to right. do with any of it. I think the truth is th the best way is somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. of those, right? Acknowledge, acknowledge history understand yeah. the depravity of the human heart, understand tribalism and how it can escalate and the problems that come when we start to focus on our differences instead of our similarities and to judge people yeah. based on their skin color, based on their gender, based on their nationality, based on their religious faith, all of this stuff, you can see where that leads to. You can see how yeah. bad it is. So I think yeah. the key is to learn from it, acknowledge it, but then go, okay, you know what? One thing about history is it's immutable. Yeah. There's we we all we have many things that we wish never happened right mm -hmm. but we can't change that we literally have zero power no one has any power to change history yeah so what do we have next we have the present we have the present and we have the future so yeah. what is the best worldview to adopt in the present that's going to yeah. lead to a happy life a content life a fruitful life a life with the success and the ability to do what you want and to have positive relationships and to interact mm -hmm. with lots of different people and to travel and to enjoy and to, you know, and in my view, if you have this harboring resentment for large swathes of the human population who have not personally wronged you, then your life is not going to be anywhere near as uh, fun, enjoyable, nor successful as it, that's, as it could so be. Good. That's so good. And I love what you said there about challenging the political perspectives the kind of um you know as you said the typical kind of right versus uh left way of, of viewing this and the deficiencies or excesses of, of either side because you know again ignoring the experiences of of people who've been hurt or harmed um you're, you're not going to be able to to engage them you're not going to be able to um they're not going to feel listened to they're not going to feel like um that they're willing to to, to trust you as as well and so as you said that the the kind of right side the excesses of kind of almost just dismissing um any uh any kind of negative experience out the gate uh is is um is on health and I, and I try to uh, i mean even in the book that i'm, I'm writing I, I try to talk about um, acknowledging the difference between being a, a legitimate victim of, of a particular circumstance or experience and then the kind of identification with with your with that traumatic experience and 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 the sort of and, and victimhood and and there is a point and I and I do touch on this in the book that yes a part of the healing process someone will is likely to identify with 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 that trauma in a way is part of the healing but there is this there's this fine line where the where the trauma itself becomes your mm. identity becomes the means by which you you sort of see yourself and almost the, the exclusive means and i think that that is where you get this problem say in the context of of race and, and by the way this is not just about how, how black people you know view things because i do find that there's a certain amount of victimhood that is is starting to become more apparent even on the on the right in terms of um people who identify as as white and seeing themselves mm -hmm. as, as sort of trapped within um you know the, the lattice of, of of race and part of what i talk about on twitter is just kind of pushing back against the assumptions of of, of racial victimhood that are that are so 
tied up in the way that we understand and talk about race in, in, in the culture. Uh, and, and I know sometimes people might challenge me and say, well, we can't get rid of race. It's just kind of part of society. I'm not saying we need to not acknowledge <laughs> all of people's skin or, or ethnic backgrounds, but I, I just call for a deeper critical analysis of what a lot of the assumptions hidden beneath when, when we talk about race and the assumptions that you know about, about a person's culture and, and, and background and, and certain psychological elements that you know as I said that often tie us down to these these um the, these wrong uh, or even if it's not to say that they're totally wrong they're just that they, they just can't be generalized mm -hmm. across so many people I mean here we are having this conversation as two quote unquote black men but with interest interest Interestingly, you know that there's so we have a lot of common ground, a lot of interest, but we've had, you know, significant different life experiences. You know, um, where where you where you were raised and, and where you've spent um, your childhood, and all these things inform the the very nuanced, um, you know, kind of makeup of, of of who we are and who our views are. And so, uh, you know, that it's as I said, I'm I'm just really interested about helping us to have better conversations about these issues, uh, challenging the the kind of single mindedness, the kind of um, you know, very sort of the, the assumption that a lot of these issues are, as I said, should be just viewed in a, in a very kind of um, yeah, singular way. Yeah. You know, when it comes to mindset and worldview, I often just think, is this helpful? Yeah. Right? Of course, is it true? Is it true is the first part. But then yeah. secondly, is is it helpful? Right? If you mm -hmm. have a mindset, if you have one of these, you know, Marxist type mindsets where it's, you know, you can just split the world very cleanly into oppressors and oppressed and the oppressed are out to get you. And if you're, you know, you're a second class citizen and these people are your enemy and that person's your enemy and the game is rigged and you can't even win because the game is rigged and this and this and there's the patriarchy and there's white supremacy and there's all these forces, these mystical, magical forces that you can't really, you know, structural racism, systemic, institutional racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, all these things that are working against you. Is that helpful, right? Is, is, that, a, is that a worldview and a mindset that's going to help you win and be successful and to be happy? And the yeah. obvious and clear answer is no, which oh. is why the people who adopt this, I mean, you said it yourself, when you adopted these mind views, my, you, this mindset, you know, you started to feel depressed, you started to feel anxious, you started to feel bitter, resentful, angry at other people. And so one of my things is one way I know that my mindset is better than this like woke mind virus is because I'm happy. I'm successful. I'm going to be happier and I'm going to be more successful. And I'm so someone can spend their whole time. They can spend months. They can spend years. They can spend decades in this matrix of victimhood. And they might feel this, you know, sort of self righteousness about it. Mm -hmm. But I'm lo I look at their life. I'm like, well, you're not, you're not happy. This is not conducive to you. So even yeah. if, even if someone may think that that's the, you know, that that's the truth and that's, you know, that's the reality and that's it. And that's just how it is. And the world is just like that and whatever. I'm like, okay, dude, you know, you can, you can believe that. And I, there's kernels, as I said before, there's kernels of truth to what you're saying. But if you take it to that far level where you just identify with it, and, and here's another point, when people identify as a victim, mm -hmm. I've never, I don't think I've ever articulated this thought before, but I'm just thinking it now, what actually happens, and you see this all the time is because the victimhood is their identity, mm -hmm. they begin to defend it, right? So if so people start to defend the thing that's actually oppressing them, right? Which is coming from their own mindset. So if you say that you are, you know, you are this thing, you are this victim, and then someone is like, someone even is trying to even encourage you. Someone is trying to help you and snap you out of this and say, hey, actually, you know, here, here's the situation or here's the reality. Here's something you can do. You actually get mad at the person who is trying to help you and lift you up because mm -hmm. you think that they are challenging your they're attacking your identity, right? They're attacking who you are because you've wrapped yourself up so tightly in this mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think once people are there, it's, um, you know, you can still certainly help them, but it becomes very difficult because they're defending the thing that is actually oppressing them. Um, yeah. And that's quite wow. a fascinating phenomenon. Yeah, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's what, what you're saying there that just resonates um, so deeply it's and and the and why this is so cyclical 
in terms of, you know, you, you get to that stage where you, you identify. And then, like you said, someone tries to challenge and then you, <laughs> you kind of double down and it's, it's sad because you can really get to such a deep place of anguish and despair. I mean, that it is, it is unreal. And, and so many people are trapped in that cycle. And that, that, that's why I think this conversation is so important and we're having here because like you've said, and, and you embody in the way that you address these issues is saying, guys, guys and girls, we have to be able to, to get ourselves out of this trap. We, you know, you, you can't live a life where you're just so um, strung down by by despair. There, there's no hope. There's no hope. I mean, the world at the moment, gosh, the, the, the one thing we need is hope. It feels like we're on the verge of, of, of war. It feels like the West is legitimately on the verge of collapse in so many ways. We have ideologues that are running rampage and, and it feels like we we just have yeah that there's that hope has just been burnt out of the, the like the oxygen in the room this this mm. it's just been completely consumed uh and 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 i'm sorry as a person of, of faith and i know that you share my faith as well so yeah i i believe that that hope you know is uh, that, that we do have hope and that, that there is an opportunity um uh, we can we should cultivate that hope despite i think it's a line from um though though hope is frail it's hard to kill it's a line mm. from the prince of egypt um one of mm -hmm. the one of the in that line and it's 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 stuck with me it is frail in this in this world but i mean i think if you can grab onto even just the fiber of hope i mean as i said for you know for, for christians that you know we do have a hope in christ but i mean I, I believe that if you can find something that you can say look this is something that can help me to to actually still have a have a view of of, of life that can help me to navigate from point a to point b and i can get better because mm. but if your view is just despair you will have nothing to motivate you to want to improve your life and that's mm -hmm. why so many people stuck in victimhood despite the fact that they may well have opportunities and resources uh, even if they're not that much to be able to to improve their life they won't be able to see it and won't be able to grab a hold of it because there is no hope um and i thought i'd love to be able to just read a little bit of my the introduction to to my book that i've written and it will be an exclusive for your audience because okay, i feel like rises a little bit of why I've write, you know, why I wanted to write the book and, and some of what I hope that it will help um, achieve in the, read, in the readers. So I wrote this, I said, I asked myself this question in early 2023 and the feeling that remained with me is the reason for writing this book. What is the deadliest poison of human potential? As a physician, I've learned a thing or two about poisons. There's a whole subspecialty of medicine called medical toxicology that deals with the study of poison substances and their effects on humans. It involves the prevention, the diagnosis and treatment of poisoning caused by different categories of toxins. And it's quite fascinating. The most poisonous toxins to humans can vary depending on the dose and route of exposure that they include, but they include toxins like botulinum, tetanus, cyanide, which also spread, and ricin that can cause catastrophic respiratory failure and death. But the category of toxicity that prompted this question is beyond the scope of medical toxic, uh, toxicology, however, and perhaps more to do with human psychology and spirituality. I spent much of the last year contemplating my life and how much I had achieved, the opportunities presented to me, and recognized that of all the poisons I've encountered, one singular toxin eventually emerged as the greatest threat to me losing everything. This threat wasn't immediately obvious to me and required some digging, self-exploration and therapy to get to the bottom of it all. You could say I had to formulate my own plan to investigate and diagnose the toxin that was such a lethal threat to maximizing my potential. So how did this young, successful family physician of Jamaican heritage living in the UK, married to the love of his life with two beautiful children, raised by two loving educated parents, find himself poisoned by resentment and devoid of hope and the future? That singular toxin was victimhood. And I'll stop there because I could read on a little bit more, but I, you know, it's it's where, like I said, it's saying that I think victimhood can 
poison us in ways and it's evident that it has um, from, from being able to grasp hope and to achieve, um, you know, whatever we can. I think every person who's been, who's got breath in their lungs has an opportunity at life and can make something for themselves. And there's evidence of people who had the most horrendous starts in life and, and have done amazing things because they had someone around them that helped to cultivate that hope. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you for the exclusive. I like that writing and that's, that's powerful, man. And you know, even from a religious and from a Christian perspective, I think adopting a mindset of despair, and even worse, promoting a mindset of despair is, it's a sin. I, mm -hmm. I'd say it's a it's a it's a massive sin, right? It's actually very, it's actually very unchristian to be promoting those type of worldviews. Because the thing about despair is if there is no hope, look, here, here, here's what it comes down to fundamentally. If there is no hope, there is no purpose in living. Yeah. So anyone who has ever taken themselves out of this world by killing themselves, mm -hmm. they reached a point where in their own mind, in their own mindset, they believed that there was no hope. There is no hope, therefore, it's a very logical progression. If there mm -hmm. is no hope, that means that the future has no potential to be better than the past. That's what mm -hmm. hopelessness is, right? It means the future, the future is going to be worse no matter what than the past is. Mm -hmm. And if that is the situation, it's not a huge jump to see how someone reaches a point, well, what is the point in continuing to live if the future is just going to be worse you know, life has already peaked, like everything's just going to get worse. There's no more, there's no more joy to come. There's no more mm -hmm. opportunity to come. There's no more happiness, no more relationships, no more love, no more anything to come in the future. It's a very suicidal mindset, in fact. And I think yeah. that happens both individually, but also collectively, right? If mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest problems we're facing in the West right now is lack of optimism and this hopelessness on a national, on a societal scale, right? And it's difficult and it's hard because in some ways our the countries are are moving forward and progressing, but in other ways they're they're backsliding and they're becoming more regressive and more concerning. And that even I'll tell you what, I, I know a lot of people. I mean, I'm sure you do. There are millions of people, millions of young people, especially in their thirties right now, who and this is true of regardless of their religious views, regardless of their political views, who don't want to bring children into this world because of that hopelessness because they don't think that their children's life would mm. be better than theirs or better than their parents. They think, okay, well, it's everything is declining. So why would I even want, I, I see people on the right saying this. I see people on the left saying this. I see religious people, non-religious people saying, you know, oh gosh, you'd be crazy to, you'd be crazy to bring children into this world, right? Like I'm not going to be able to offer them better than what I had. So why even do it? And again, on a, on a national level, that's suicidal. If you don't, if, if countries don't even propagate, if people refuse to even propagate because they feel so much hopelessness and doom and gloom, there literally will not even be future generations to inherit the nation and inherit the world. So, you know, I think, um, well, last point on this is I do also think that the past, um, the events of 2020 and up to up through 2022 with all the global fear mongering and the virus scares and all the confusion and all that, I, I think it's affected people, I think, far more than they realize. Oh. I, I, I think it, w w it's weird because people are kind of trying to just move on and not talk about it and act like it didn't happen and act like people didn't do what they do. It didn't. But we haven't even remotely recovered from it, right? Regardless of someone's position on the whole situation, we were people were hammered with 700 to 900 plus days of fear, of division, isolation, confusion, despair, anger, people were taken out of their usual routines at work in college in schools and everything. And you can't just snap your fingers and everything totally returns to normal because you still have, you still have that memory. And I think that, you know, there's this inertia of the negativity and of the fear and of the hopelessness and uncertainty, which has now just kind of, I don't know, like it, it's, it's just in people now. Because I, I find I find now that people are just generally, I, 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 again, regardless of sides and beliefs and whatever, I'm just finding people generally now are 
less optimistic and and just a bit more sort of angry and resentful than they were in 2018 and 2019. And in 2018 and 2019, we all we thought people were already going crazy, but it just seems like people are just more. There's just this 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 negativity and demoralization that's just. Mm. It's just there. I see it even with some of my, you know, favorite commentators or people that I follow or whatever. It's just this, I don't know. It's just so much more negative. There's just this negative lean on cynicism of everything, yeah. you know, and it's just, oh, you know, well, the globalists are going to, you know, they're going to take over and they're, you know, they're going to enslave everybody and Klaus Schwab is going to win and the WEF and the, you know, world, new world order. And it, it's just, uh, I, I don't know. It's, um, yeah. it, it's, it's a strange thing to, to realize. I don't know if you've been seeing the same. I've been seeing the same, but you know what? What you've been saying about the importance of um, those who who feel, who see this, who witness this, to move away from just uh, giving commentary and to actually saying, okay, well, what skills do I have in my hand? What abilities um, do I have? And, and how can I use them to create a different story? to cultivate uh, a, a change in perspective, to help people to see, um, you know, a, a way forward towards towards hope. I, I'm inspired by, for instance, what you do with with music, with, with hip hop, you know, because while I, I have my concerns about the ways that hip hop at times have been used to, um, to create negative or unhelpful or, or emphasize or focus on certain um, lifestyles or approaches to, to life that may be maladaptive and especially um, in and amongst the kind of popular black community. Uh, and it's one, you could, you could be a person that just sits down and critiques negative hip hop and create a YouTube channel and do that all day long. And that's okay. That's fine. If, that, if that's your thing, but actually, how much more, you know, useful um, would you know? Is it for someone like yourself who's saying, you know, what I'm going to use the I'm going to use this because there's no denying that hip hop is an incredible art form. It it, it requires it, it unparalleled skill, um, quick thinking, wit, and and use that to to to, to you know to kind of basically pump the the air in with a, with a different message um you know yes you bring light to some of the foolishness but I, when i listen to your to your music i go away feeling so much more um uplifted and thinking okay yeah you know what and I'm, I'm really challenged to view this uh, this situation in this way as it was and i think our creativity i'm a singer and musician myself as well i play awesome. keys and guitar and i'm you know and i remember thinking one of the things when i was listening to one of your songs i'll be like you know what one day i hope for a chance that we can collaborate <laughs> you know, mm. creatively because i'm so inspired by people who are just saying you know what i'm going to use my gifts the gifts that god's given me whatever to 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 you know to make and do something that changes the narrative gives people hope you know i want to see more you know books movies mm. that that help us to move away from the the doom and gloom the world is falling apart the sky is falling kind of kind of, kind of narrative because again as you said the negativity itself just undermines um, you know, and, and poisons us from being able to see. It's like lenses. If the lenses are just completely muddied and, 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 and you know, and clouded by my, my negativity, it's going to be very difficult to be able to see uh, anything positive. And we have to change the story. We have yes. to, um, you know, I, I see this, especially amongst people who consider themselves outside of the left, whether you're centrist or, 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 or right. Let's not give so much energy to platforming what is crazy and negative and, mm. and you know i'm challenged by myself to do that i, I just i think yes there is a, some limited value in, in in discussing or bringing attention to some of these things but come on for goodness sake the 24 7 platforming yeah. and negativity and madness stop there's certain people's I'm, I'm not going to sound like as if i'm trying to be negative about certain individuals but i just don't want to see certain faces i don't want to see certain people that are just like mm -hmm. oh yes this person's <laughs> doing let's just move away from just platforming and talking about <clears throat> the stuff that aggravates us and irritates us and let's do something that will bring the change we want to see 
Yeah. It can't just be reactionary. It has to yeah. be proactive if mm -hmm. on multiple levels, because also if you're doing that, all you're doing is you're just allowing, you're just allowing the crazies to control. You're still allowing them to control the narrative and even to control yourself. If all yeah. I'm doing is just, if I'm just on Twitter or so, or Instagram or YouTube every day, just reacting to the latest stupid thing that happened on the left, then, you know, I'm, I'm just feeding it. I'm feeding mm -hmm. it. I'm growing it. I'm giving it all my energy, all my time. And everything has an opportunity cost as well. But also mm -hmm. I'm not providing a, you know, it's not hard to just point at this thing and go, this is stupid. This is silly. This is stupid. This is silly. This doesn't make sense. But it's like, okay, well, what's the alternative? And I think that people know the alternative because a lot of people are, are living it. But I wish that mm -hmm. people would promote the positive alternative more than just bashing the negative narratives or the things that are goofy or, or silly. Mm -hmm. It's why with even what I do, you know, I'm, I'm people, you know, I, I get criticized from all, all across the thing, hundreds, hundreds of times a day, whatever. But it's why I'm yeah. so big on like, you know, even just physical fitness, right? Mm -hmm. I could sit there and just talk about, you know, pe people are too fat. Everyone's getting too fat. Obesity is a problem. Hey, go to the gym, da, 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 right? You know, why aren't people going to the gym? Why? I, you know, I could talk about the food industry. I could talk about big pharma. I could talk about the medical industry. Like there's a lot of things that mm -hmm. I could talk about in even in the realm of health, diet, exercise, nutrition, but I'd rather be encouraging. I'm trying to give people yeah. tools, literally writing, writing books, giving people advice, posting videos of my own workouts, just to, to encourage, to yeah. encourage people, not just to criticize the stuff mm -hmm. that's bad or the stuff that's unhealthy, but to, mm -hmm. to, to provide this, this alternative. Um, mm -hmm. And I wish, I wish I could see more of that because there are many people. And if you actually look at their lives and what they're doing, many people, you know, they're might be you know, ha happily married and, you know, they've got families and they have wonderful children mm -hmm. and they're doing this and they're doing this and they're finding all this fulfillment, but they don't actually share it, yeah. <laughs> right? They don't really share it. You have to kind of look behind mm -hmm. the scenes, but the stuff that is being shared is mm -hmm. just all the, it's all the madness and all the anger and all the outrage fuel and and a big problem as well is that it, it is incentivized you know in this yeah. in this we live in an age of we live in an attention economy um mm -hmm. it's about clicks it's about views it's about shares it's about retweets it's about likes and it's very easy to just feed the outrage machine right it's, it's mm -hmm. not hard right i can get i could guarantee myself getting a million views per video over time if i'm just like all right i'm just gonna I'm just gonna react to craziness, right? I'm just gonna react to foolishness. Like you, you, there, there's an infinite supply, more of it's coming out every day, right? I can go on TikTok, I can go on YouTube, I can find the craziest stuff and I can just do reaction video, reaction video, reaction video. And it's like, well, okay, that's good for, that's good for my bank account, it's good for views, it's like I'm getting ad revenue or whatever, but am I really, oh, is, is this helping? Is it, again, again, it comes back to that thing I said before, is this, is this helpful? Yeah. Is yeah. this helpful? Am I inspiring anybody? No, I'm, yeah. all I'm doing actually is making people more angry, more jacked up. I'm raising the temperature. I'm, I've gone beyond just trying to bring awareness to a certain issue. And I'm mm -hmm. now just feeding that. I'm now feeding that issue and giving it energy, giving it time, which means I'm not giving the same time and energy and output to things I could be doing, like making more, making more music writing more books, creating more podcasts, having more conversations, doing more meetups, having more live events, all that positive stuff that people need. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, I hope over time, I hope over time more people adopt that mindset. I think it's a problem because the incentive structure is a little bit broken and it's a lot easier to get attention off, at least short term, it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to get attention off negativity than mm -hmm. positivity. That's just the way human beings are wired. And, um, I don't think that's changing anytime soon, but I think we all need to kind of resist the temptation to just dwell in that. It doesn't mean, like you said, it doesn't mean you never talk about it. It doesn't mean you never address or never react to anything, right? There's a time and place for that. But, you know, if I go on someone's YouTube channel or their Twitter feed or whatever, and I'm scrolling, every single thing is just, you know, it's, it, it's, it's fight videos and it's, uh, police killings and it's and it's uh you know political just some jacked up left right political stuff and it's drag queen story time and it's some like mad, like just nonstop and I'm just like how uh, you know yeah. and also I, and also I think again from from both a even even from a religious perspective even from a moral perspective I'm very cautious about the imagery that I share yeah right so I don't I don't share I don't share 
these videos of people getting killed or people having fights and brutalizing each other. I don't share videos of, of grown men twerking. I don't share videos. I, I don't share, I won't, I'm not going to share those, those images, right? Yeah. Like I don't, you're, you're not going to go on my feed and you're just scrolling through and you're seeing drag Queens and you're seeing like all sorts of weird perverse stuff because it's like, well, either way you're seeing it, even if I'm criticizing it, I'm still, I'm still sharing that with millions of people. Yeah. Right. And I, I think people, again, need to be a bit more conscious of like, okay, well, wh what are these yeah. images and videos that you are, you are sharing? Cause people are still, people are still seeing it. Um, yeah. so where's that line between, you know, I think you can, you can criticize something mm -hmm. without, or even raise awareness of something without sharing the, the graphics and without sharing the not safe for work content and, and so on. Um, but I think again, people are so much in the in tribal mode and in rage mode yeah. that you know I, I've said this many times, and you know people criticize me for saying this, right? They're like, "Well, you know, if if, if people don't share it, how are people going to know that it's happening?" Or I'm like, "Okay, dude, you know, I mean, like, I'm not going to dictate. I'm not going to dictate anybody's strategy. I'm just saying, as somebody who is quote unquote actually more on your side, I don't think that doing this 24 seven is." particularly helpful. I'm not, I'm not convinced it's a net positive, especially yeah. when you're not providing, you know, we know you're angry, right? We get it. We know you're, we, we know you're angry, but you know, what's the positive solution? What's the, yeah. what's the better narrative? What's the better story? What's the better thing we can give people to aspire to mentally, physically, spiritually, financially relationships, how we deal with other people. That's where people need, that's where people yeah. need help not just to point at that thing and go, hey, look at what this crazy person is doing. You're absolutely right. My, my really quick response to some of what you said there, um, I just want to encourage you, Zubi, because I think I feel like what you you put yourself out there, as you said, you've been you'll draw attacks from people from from everywhere. But, you know, the, the truth is having engaged and looked at your stuff and and found I've just found that you, you stand out to me as as a light in this kind of like this crazy um, world where as you said everybody seems to be kind of more focused on either uh you know trying to try to see if they can uh, by the way there's nothing wrong with being able to make money from doing what you do but the but but doing it in a way where it's clearly just about maximizing profit and clickbait and so on and it's like but no that's not what you get when you engage the content you put out there mm. um, and it is inspiring it certainly inspired me as someone who's relatively newer to this kind of world of of engaging um in the, in the kind of the, the politics of uh i guess kind of center right and trying to kind of challenge uh, or at least inspire people to move away from the woke virus and mm. see the dangers of it from talking about my own story and hopefully others can can um but again but it's it's about changing minds to towards uh you know embracing hope towards um you know enjoying their lives and not just being kind of stuck in perpetual despair mm -hmm. mode but i think doing what you do uh, at the level that you're doing it with with the influence that you have you know with a million followers on twitter you, you will be drawing all manner of you know, um, negativity as a result of that. But you know, to see how you still remain positive, to see how you still smile, and you've not become, um, you know, sucked into the uh, to the woe is me because I'm sure you've had probably death threats and all sorts as a result of what you're doing. Uh, so just 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 to say hand on heart, I, I'm really encouraged and inspired by by the stand that you've taken um, and how open you are about your 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 faith as well. Because I think I think I think for me, one really quick thing about the, the you know the, the central idea. In in the Christian message, you know, you've got this this idea of, of, of you know Jesus who you know came and basically is you know kind of wrongly accused of of, of being you know kind of a blasphemer and a, a, and a sort of a, a problem to, to to the Roman state and 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 basically is is is, is murdered for all his uh, all, all intents and purposes really um, you know unjustly. But you know, but how the, the the message ends up actually, you know, being put puts the whole that the whole unjust system on, on its head, and rather than just kind of lamenting about how unfair and and, and how unjust his the, 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 you know his killing was, it, it's the whole message is transformed into something positive to say actually Jesus you know took on this this kind of unjust punishment for the benefit and even showed forgiveness to those around him you know. Who, who didn't know what, what they were doing. And so somehow 
allowing our, ourselves not not I mean like in the same way with that message of not being sucked into the um what, what was so negative and despairing and horrible about it but allowing allowing that 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 message to transform our hearts in, into something more hopeful so I think even if for, for people who are not religious uh, I mean hopefully they can relate to the analogy there of let's let's move now towards you know you know, as I said, a, a more positive uh, message, encouraging people to see that we can still, uh, we have come so far, and I believe that we, we can go further, and, and we can, you know, as I said, I'm not talking about a, a utopia, a perfect world, I'm talking about, I believe, a world that we, we have the basic tools, we have the basic ideas to have a world that is that is more just, that is more fair, and at, and at the same time, where we can all flourish to a greater degree. Um, so I'm just encouraged to want to be part of the solution towards that, man. And, and as I said, I'm just grateful you have me on your platform here to just, you know, to share my my little two, two cents. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you for the kind words. Awesome. Joel, where can people find and follow you online? Yeah, so I'm I'm essentially on Twitter. Um, so just at Joel Brown MD, you'll be able to find me on there. Um, um, what I was going to suggest, if uh, if you go to Joel Brown MD and the pinned um, tweet on there, I will have some information about this upcoming book, and I'll just keep it on there. And you can uh, sign up to my Substack as well. Um, I will I send you the links in the description, just so that you'll you'll be first to informed when I release uh, my, my upcoming book. And um, please, you know, feel free to share that with other people and come and say hi to me. I'm really approachable, really willing to have conversations on on, on Twitter. Inbox me, that's fine. I, I will try my best to get back to inbox messages because I do get a lot of them uh, trying to juggle my busy life but uh, looking forward to connecting with your audience as well nice one Joel thanks for coming on the show man I appreciate you brother you're welcome